Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to tell you a story about the Sri Lankan architecture and the profession of architect in Sri Lanka. I need to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Paolo for inviting me for this presentation. So let's go to the story. There's a last part of the story is about the profession, how the profession of architecture is developed in Sri Lanka, which is, I don't think you all are much interested about it, but I'm compelled to say a few words because I have been past president of the Institute of Architects. Anyway. So going forward, Uh, you can see, uh, uh, I first I need to show where Sri Lanka is in the world map. This is a Sri Lanka on the Pacific map. Sri Lanka is right there, right? I think you can see the mouse here, right? So it's it's the end at the edge of the of India, right? So let me go to the second slide. These are some statistics about Sri Lanka. I thought it might be nice to get an idea of what Sri Lanka is all about. It's only 6,000 square kilometers in size, it's a small country. Out of the above, 1,340 kilometers are square kilometers in water. So it's only the balance that is available. Length is only 432 kilometers, width is only 224 kilometers. Highest point, of course, is 2,525 meters from the MSL. Length of the coast is 1,340 kilometers. Population is huge, 22.2. I just put the figures, Australia sets 7.67 million square meters, square kilometers, and the population 26. So you can see the density between the two countries. This is just to get a feel of what the country is about. Now, Sri Lanka has several zones. You see, it's very important because the, the architecture, the history of architecture also is compared or can be compared with the zones. You see, you see the yellow area is the dry zone, right? And the green, dark green area is the wet zone. And the brown area is the hill country. There are two red patches, which are the arid zones, which are fairly difficult to live in. You see, they are very hot and humid and so on and so forth. I will also tell at this point, Sri Lanka's climate is unique. At any given time, we don't have any uh, seasons as such. We have the wet and the dry season. But even in those, right, the temperatures don't go down. They are at 20s all the time. Maybe only on the hill country, it might go down to about 16, 18, that's all. And the humidity is always at 95, 90. Right? There are, because of that unique climatic condition, there are certain things that are unique to Sri Lanka. So one of the things I can tell you is that I heard recently from a scientist, uh, the fungus that are used, the very valuable fungus that are used for medications, right? There are 180 odd. Out of the 180 odd, 120 odd is only available in Sri Lanka because of the, that unique climatic culture. So that's all about it. I don't want to go further. You are a competition to architecture, not, right? So this is the first recorded civilization of Sri Lanka where a uh, sewing lady supposed to have come to Sri Lanka from one of the closest close countries and she got, she got married to the king of Sri Lanka at that time called Vijay. And Sri Lanka was originally known as Kambapani or Taprobe and then it became Ceylon after the British period, when the British came in, and then it became 
Sri Lanka in 1972 came back to Sri Lanka. So that's about uh, the introduction to the thing. So let's go. These are the glimpses of Tambapani still remain the oldest possible uh, uh, structures that were built, right? Uh, domestic scale structures. Washland of structure means it's built with bamboo and mud. And the roof, they have used the roof with either paddy husk or coconut, dried coconut leaves. So this, you can see the gentleman who is there. He's a, he's a chief of the Vedas, that is the, uh, 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 the chief of the jungle, right? So one of those guys are seated there. So this, this, call, this thing is called the V-Bis, that is where they store the paddy, right? It's a mud structure and, uh, and it's raised off the ground to avoid any dampness, right? And you have the same roof and the paddy is stored in those. They, are, they were called V-Bis, V is paddy, Bis is the container. So this is the very earliest days. Now come to the, now you saw the dry zone. Now this, these are the first areas of uh, architecture, right? Developed in Sri Lanka. The Anuradhapura period. Anuradhapura is one of the, in the dry zone, one of the capitals, the first capitals of Sri Lanka, right? So they had, yeah, we can, while you're going, you can see there's, there was technology used very heavily, right? You can see the shapes and you can see the, the lower Mahapai, which is here, right? This was a seven story building. Only the remains are the ground floor columns. But these were all stone technology. They, they had a very advanced stone technology. When you go to the next slide, you will see, you can see the bottom two slides, right? These are Muragali, that's the guard stone. And that is uh, Sandakata Pahana, that is a stepping stone to any uh, important building or any place. You had a, a, a place for the stepping stone, which is called, uh, you can see how intricate they have been carved. So there should have been some very advanced technology at that time, right? And you can see these two stupas in front, on top, the Mirisavati and Ruan Melissa. They are huge, right? I'll tell you, uh, uh, Ruan Valley Sire is uh, 72 meters high and 108 meters in diameter, right? So it's a very large structure. So even today's context, to set it up, it's not that easy to get the exact shape and to get the exact shape. You see, if you go to the pyramids, the same thing, right? I, when I visited uh, Egypt once, I wanted to go and see the pyramids. If you go to one of the corners and see it's absolutely straight, and how can, it's not done in concrete, done in bricks and blocks. How can you get that sharp, perfect edge right across? It's like it's absolute straight line. There are no quilts. So that, at the same period, right? So there would have been some technology which was fairly advanced, we don't know. Uh, then at the same time, it comes to my mind about the chariots of the God. Maybe you all have read that book, some of you. If the chariots of God says about a picture that is drawn in South America, in the desert, you can only identify it as a proper picture when you go 30,000 meters uh, feet up. So how did somebody draw that? unless somebody went up and gave instructions or some other technique. So these are things that I think, uh, so that's why technology at that time would have been advanced, but we don't know to date what it was, right? Okay. Then this is what I want to show. The small as the first kingdom, capital, and center of Buddhism in the island, Anuradhapura has seen the reign of more than 100 kings over a period of 13 centuries. It is one of the most extensive archaeological heritage centers in the world. 
The Bergamas, or the huge brick structures constructed utilizing contemporary engineering skills, are the most attractive. The Atamastana, or eight places, are considered the main sites in Anuradhapura, namely the Sri Mahabodhya, Tuparame, Loha Prasade, or the Brazen Palace, Mirisavatya, Ruan Velisaya, Abhegiri, Lankarame, and Chetvanarame. Arahat Mahindra, the son of the great Indian emperor Dharma Ashoka, introduced Buddhism to Sri Lanka in the 3rd century BC. The king of Anuradhapura at the time was Devanampiyadis. He was the leading royal instrumental in bringing the sapling of the sacred Bodhi tree from North India. It was Devi Sangamitta, the sister of Arahant Mahinda, who brought the sapling to Sri Lanka, which was subsequently planted in Anuradhapura. The first recorded evidence of the erection of the Tuparama Dagaba, enshrining the right collarbone of the Buddha, was found during the reign of King Devarampiyadisa. A great architectural achievement of King Dutugamanu, constructed in the 2nd century BC, was Loha Prasade, the Brazen Palace. This edifice then accommodated the community of monks and was used as a chapter house. Legend is that the Mirisavatya Dagava was built by King Zutugamanu to mark his victory over King Elara. The greatest work undertaken by King Zutugamanu was the Ruan Valley Sire, now restored to its original form. Considering its enormous proportions, the chroniclers have called it Mahatupa. The Abhegiri Dagava, built in the 1st century BC, is a monument constructed by King Vattagam. The Samadhi Buddha statue, guard stone, Moonstone, Arms Hall, and the Twin Ponds are within the premises of Abhegiri. The legend has it that the Dagaba, commonly known as Lankarame, constructed on a terrace, is a memorial to his queen consort Soma Devi, built by King Vattagamani. The Jetavana Dagaba was built by King Mahasen in the 3rd century AD and is the largest Dagaba in Sri Lanka. Isurumunia is a part of a large monastery complex dating back to the 3rd century BC. Among the sculptures found at that site, the lovers is the most famous. The gigantic artificial lakes or bevers of Anuradhapura are not merely beautiful but adorn the city and also provide water to the city throughout the year. These ancient constructions, left for posterity by successive kings, are of immense use in irrigating land for agriculture. The eternal sacred city and its palaces, monasteries, monuments and lakes, rediscovered in the 19th century, are now World Heritage Sites, declared thus by UNESCO in 1982. Right, so As the first uh, kingdom, uh, capital and center. Now we come to Sigiria. Maybe some of you all have heard about Sigiria, the rock fortress. It's one of the uh, world famous uh, frescoes, right? And the lion paw entrance, and the approach, then there's uh, the, the entire uh, palace was built right on top of Sigiria. Now, this was built there because there was a story about the brother, two brothers, right? One killed the father and became the king and the, to escape from the other brother, he built it on the top so that he's secured. So that's the story about. Uh, but today's context, Sigiria is one of the most look forward place to see in uh, Sri Lanka as for a tourist, right? So I will take you as, excuse me, this will be the next last movie. <laughs> After that, it will be all. Because this is such a nice thing I didn't want to see. Thank you. 
That's it. Then we come to the polar narrow period again on the dry zone, right? The next after Anuradhapura, the polar narrow kingdom came in. So here again, you can see a lot of uh, advanced uh, stone technology and irrigation. You see, and you can see the 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 slide here. There, sorry. Irrigation works. You see, you they carried water across paddy fields, right, through a constructed canal on stone pillars, right. So this is during that period. So all this, as I told you, there have been very advanced technology at that time. So you can see the water dage again with the. Uh, stone and the two guard stones, Lanka Tilaka Vihara. Then, of course, Parak, King Parak Bahu was the main king that uh, ruled uh, Polonaru. So, his statue is there, so forth. Then, Buddhism and architecture. You see in Sri Lanka, most uh, historic buildings, structures are related to Buddhism, right? So, you can see on the Right corner, Sri Pada. This is in top of a hill in the central province where they say that Lord Buddha came and put his footprint, and everybody climbs that. Thousands of people climb to see this. There's a story in Sri Lanka they say if you have not gone to Sri Pada once, you are a fool, and if you have gone there more than once, then you're a damn fool. Right, it's so difficult. I have been once only. That's the key. Right? So, so that's a thing. Then Damula Temple, which you must see, this is a World Heritage Site again. Site again. Damula Temple has, is actually is renewed for its temple painting. The entire cave inside is painted, right? With beautiful paintings. And I'm fortunate to be in part of the team who got involved with the Cultural Triangle Rest Restoration Project, Damula Temple, right? And then Watadage is a uh, thing that is a curved or a, a circular building with Buddha statue on that. And then Galvihara statue is the, the biggest statue, uh, sleeping statue of Buddha in Sri Lanka. And Damula Rock Temple is where they, you can see that now there, you can see the rock and inside is the cave where the paintings are. The front is built with bricks and mud. The blend of Hindu, you see, Sri Lanka always had Hindu blend in because we had a, a Hindu population in Sri Lanka from history, historically. So there were buildings that were related or got Hindu influence. And these are some of the things, this uh, one in the, the one here is in Polonaro, right? You see the, uh, during the Polonaro period, the Siva Devale was built, right? So it has a, a Hindu influence. Then the Nalanda Gedige, now these are very important, it's, uh, uh, very unique because uh, this was all declared one of the UNESCO uh, things. And then we, this was sunk in a lake. So we had to dig it out, bring it back and put it on top and build it again. And this is how it is now. The bottom picture shows how it is now. Blend of Hindu again. These are, some of these are fairly new, not the old stuff, some are new. Nalur Kandaswami temple is a temple that everybody who goes to Jaffna will visit before you go to Jaffna, right? So these are two pictures of the Nalun Kansan temple. And this one, Muneswaram Kovil, is between Colombo and Anuradhapur. 
So all the pilgrims who goes to Anuradhapura visit this. They have no mind. Buddhism is not an issue, right? They, they visit this temple and go there. So these are some Hindu influence. Uh, in. Then we came from the Polon Narrow period, then came to the Kurunagar, that is on the center area. You can see I saw it in the map, the central area, with the part of the, the central area is, the, uh, is in the wet zone, right? Right on the top of the wet zone. So this is, you can see the two buildings that are built so here and here, they are on stilts, right? In Singhala, we call them Tampita Viharas. Vihara is the temple, Tampita is on top, on stilts, right? So these were built to avoid the uh, flooding, right? So that, that I said it's on the wet zone. And you can see most of these temples are, you have to climb up. Right, the upper world. They are very beautiful places. If you visit Sri Lanka, you must go and see these places. Panduasnura and Damadinia. These are the uh, structures that are there, which preserved, are related to the Kurunagala Damadinia Yapawa period, that is the, uh, getting into the central area. Then, then came the Kote period. You see, now from uh, the central province, we came down. Kote is very close to Colombo. Is where the uh, uh, one before the last king of Sri Lanka, or Ceylon, ruled Sri Lanka. So this Kalani Rajama Vihare is a very famous temple. Everybody wants to visit there. If you come, then Verakanda and Verakanda. Yes, Verakanda temple. These are some the interesting. Uh, buildings preserved in the Korte period. Then you come to the kingdom of the mountains. That is the last kingdom of Sri Lanka, right? And you see the famous temple of the truth. Right? It's built you are right around the temple you get a pond, right? And this is built next to a huge lake called the Candy Lake. And this is where the Temple of the Truth, you see the, he said that one of the truth of the Lord Buddha is preserved there. So everybody visits this place and there is a, in August there is a huge, big ceremony every August with the Poya. Poya is the full moon day, right? The holiday in Sri Lanka, right? So all full moon days are holiday in Sri Lanka. Because everybody wants to go to the temple. So, so this is a way, uh, this also is part of the World Heritage Site, right? And Dalada uh, Maliga uh, or the Temple of the Tooth is, a, is the most important building in the Kandy region. So, after that, you know what happened. The British came, the, the Portuguese came, the British came. As uh, a Dutch came and British came, and then, of course, Portuguese and the Brit uh, the Dutch could not get control of the whole country. They were able to control only the coastal area, but the British took control of the whole country after the Candian Kingdom. This is from the Candian era, Garuda Deni Vihara in back to Deva. Now you can see these are called Devas because they had Hindu influence. Right? These, uh, no, these are two viharas and these are Devala. These are very famous buildings that if when you are visiting or you're traveling from Colombo to Kandy, you must not miss these. Then I just want to show that in 1982, UNESCO Cultural Triangle Project came in and they identified Sigiriya, Arrasbara, Pulonaru as cultural triangle projects, and they made all those uh, UNESCO <coughs> heritage sites. They're all listed. The Whatever you saw there in the pictures of Anurad Pulaprona and Sigiri are listed as World Heritage Sites. And in 1988, right, the UNESCO extended Kandy, the Temple of the Tooth and the surroundings, 
And you will see subsequently a slide of the golf fort were declared as a world heritage site. And Singharaja is the jungle, right? It's a jungle, preserved jungle, right? As I told you the, that uh, fungus that is available there because it has a, that perfect climate required for growing of fungus. Then we come to the modern, not modern era, the past British period, the influence of Moor, right? We have a lot of influence of Moor in Sri Lankan architecture in many places, right? You can see the mosque, mosque in Putla, that is towards the Colombo on Rajpura tribe. Some are Shrinkamali, right in the north. And this is Kankasanture, that's also in the north, right? And this is in the south. So you can see the slight difference between the architecture between the southern part and the other, because this is influenced by Portuguese and Dutch architecture. Then Mughal again, you can see the, these are in Colombo, one is in Colombo, the red one, you can see it's a very popular place. And this is Juma Mosque in the Otagal, that is very close to Colombo again. Then during, between the British period, uh, between the Kandy period and the British period, right? Or soon after the British took over, there was this, uh, thing uh, about uh, the buildings or the, the elite houses called the courtyard house, right? The courtyard house came in to be in, it's, in singer you call them Valaurs, right? Right, Valaurs is the is, uh, elite houses, right? And they built, because they were elite, they were not very happy to open up. You see, so they built a courtyard in the center and they built a house around it, right? And this became a style or uh, in the modern art because it serves the purpose of uh, security and ventilation, right? It became a two purpose because when you open up small openings and then you had this courtyard, the wind starts moving through and every, so it was one, uh, that's one of the reasons to do that. So I'm going to show you some pictures of some courtyard houses. The one uh, here is, of course, uh, is a modern one. Modern has been about 60, 50 years ago. This is one of the oldest courtyard houses. You can see the veranda, all that is opening into this. Outside is very almost covered with few windows, right? So everybody lives around this, the family. You see, get together around the courtyard. So this is also a fairly old one, and this is a new, a new courtyard adapted. The, the concept is adapted in the new building, new house. The Renaissance and Sri Lanka, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British influence. You can see how it has changed. Right now, this is Portuguese influence. You can see. Mainly the Portuguese influence was on churches, right? Because Catholicism was brought in and then they built some beautiful churches. Uh, this one, you can see, is a beautifully done, this is uh, in call. Then you go to the, Dutch, the arch and all that came into being with that, then the Dutch influence. Now Dutch, the one of the most important thing is this, this place, God Fort. Now this God Fort is also now a UNESCO uh, heritage site. God Fort is the only Dutch fort, living Dutch fort in the world. It's a, it's a small, like a small city inside. People are living, restaurants are there, churches are there, banks are there. It's a small city. The buildings are all reserved, all buildings. There are no buildings are allowed to build inside. The old building, they, they, you can do the interiors, but fit, uh, retrofit, but no external changes are allowed. Right? It's a heritage site. And it's one of the, it's the only living fort, Dutch fort in the world. So it's a fantastic place. 
If you visit, you must see the God Court because architecture is fantastic. And I must tell a small story about the God Court. They had a drainage system, right? Unique drainage system. All the roads or the pathways had small manholes with holes and all that, right? All the drainage was brought in there. When the sea level rises in the evening, the drainage gets filled. And in the morning, when the sea level drops, the entire system gets washed up. So that was the system size uh, that was uh, really unique to God Fort. Then Dutch influence. Another one I think you must never miss is this Dutch Fort, Dutch hospital in Kalamu, which is now a, a very luxurious restaurant complex. Everybody goes there. Very expensive place. It's beautifully renovated or retrofit. The Dutch hospital. So there are some, I mean, there are many buildings in Colombo that are retrofitted and used for the purpose. But the, the entire the, the exterior and the quality of space is maintained. So these are the buildings that you can see the transformation from the olden architecture to the influence of the colonial period, right? Main Street Candy. This is the Colombo National Museum building, a lot of arches. Then Richmond Castle. This is a building, Slave Island. It's a, like a shopping area. Then this is a College of Technology in Maradana, which is the oldest technology, uh, technology college, technology college in Sri Lanka. Continuing, uh, you must have seen this nine arch bridge in Ella, very famous. Again, they built using the arch technology, they built this bridge uh, across uh, a valley to this on the Colombo uh, country route. A very famous place. Then the golf club in Noreli, you can see golf club means the British have already come in the golf. And then Grand Oriental Hotel Colombo, then Edison Bangalore Hotel. These are all now, you see, has become now the, the golf club in uh, Noreli was a golf club, but there are other buildings in Noreli or Hakil uh, Country, which are governors Bangalore. So now they are all hotels, luxurious hotels today. Remember, because the, <coughs> the quality of space is fantastic. So they didn't want to do anything, they just converted interior. Right, with furniture and all that. Thank you. <coughs> Continuing, now you can see this uh, picture, Mount Lavinia Hotel. Now this is built right onto the sea on a rock, right, part of this rock. Now this was originally Governor's Bangalore, now converted to Hotel, Mount Rainier Hotel is one of the most famous hotels in Kalamba, historical hotels. You can see here Tharu Villa, it's a villa which was built, it's, it's on the bungalow, right? Uh, one of the elite bungalows, now converted to Tharu Villa Hotel. Then you can see some old British type uh, bungalows, big ones, right? So there is a whole heap of Things that you can see in club and in old town hall. Then uh, Cargill's building. <coughs> you see, uh, Cargill's and Miller's was one of the oldest uh, businesses in Sri Lanka in the trade. So this building, the red color building, very popular building in Colombo. It still functions as it was originally a what do you call it, a store, right? But now it's they have a proposal to convert back into a uh, same old stores again. Then old parliament, that's again the British period. Then Tintigel, Tintigel Colombo. This uh, there's some story to this. This is the building, the Colombo building of the Bandaranaika family, which was called the Rosmid Place Valaur. Now it's converted to a 
Trinity is preparing. University of Colombo, the oldest university in Sri Lanka. Then the Colombo Municipal Council. Then Norelia Post Office. These are all heavily influenced with British architecture. Post Victorian again. Some old pictures. Port Main Street, General Post Office Colombo, Grand Oriental Hotel, and the Old Town Hall. These are old picture. Of course, in the previous slide you saw the, the how it is, how it looks today. It's wrong. Then came the influence after the British period when Sri Lanka got independence and then started working on the own. Then came influence from other areas, Soviet and so on and so forth. Where you see, uh, Russia was at that time very popular about apartments or, or buildings, uh, houses in block form in uh, many stories are. So that influence came in and most of these buildings that I show you here are flat, we call them flats and apartments that were built during that period between today and the British period. This is a very, uh, this is a low cost housing project which they used to build to uh, rehabilitate slum dwellers and uh, open up a very important area for the type of development. Then the modern movement, right? Between this and that, then came the modern movement in architecture in Sri Lanka. And these three people are the people who are responsible for who initiated the modern movement in architecture. Jeffrey Bauer, maybe you all have heard about him. Minet de Silva, it's not a very popular character, but she's one of the pioneers. I think one of your lecturers have written a book on it. Anuma has written a book on Minute and Valentine, both, right? Because everybody writing about Jeffrey Bau, but very few wrote about the Minute, uh, has to be very important people, right? Who influence modern movement. Now, uh, I'd like to tell, tell a small story about I had the opportunity of working with Minute on one project where I was working abroad and came back and uh, I was looking for some work, and then my previous employee said, Janta, uh, Minet is looking for somebody to help her do a project. He did the Indian uh, Cultural Center competition. So I worked with her for about three months, and I worked from her home in Kandy. And unique, I must tell this story that she's such a beautiful, nice lady. Uh, the first day I, after, in the morning, I got up and I went to the breakfast table and he was sitting there. I got late to get up, about 8 39. She's sitting there saying, Madam, what are you doing here? Said, You're my guest. I can't eat till you come. So she <laughs> was, I must tell this again, she's such a nice lady. So, and she's the author for the Vanister Fletcher, Asian part history, Asian part until she passed away. So I must tell about her because she influenced both Jeffrey. Definitely she had a lot of influence on Jeffrey Bauer. And Valentine Gunasekara was the, at that time, all the man who's looking forward for, for modern architecture. And the building that is shown here at the bottom, if you go to CN, these are the end of the sea in Tangor, down south. If you go to CN, look at this, looks like a ship. It's looks like a ship. You go to see and look at it, right? So, and these are some. Let me let's go to the now. These are some buildings that I'm highlighting on Mr. Bowers, Edward Reed and Peg. That was the firm name because he took over from a British firm. So, Jeffrey Bowers' country estate called Lulu Gaga is anybody who come to Sri Lanka want to visit. There are some. Features that, uh, I mean, I can't explain, you have to go and see it, right? One thing that I really realized is there is a huge garden and, and it's a sill out and you see on the sky, the flat edge, 
and he has planted a huge tree, not from the center, to the side. It gives a different feel. So you see, he has planted this purpose so that it doesn't sit on the side. And not, I mean, others are all longer than he put on the center. So he's a real creator, right? And uh, yeah, there are these. In our silver house, a very famous house still, uh, restaurant, went to the beach, hotel. Then Kandalam Hotel, of course, you all know. I must tell you this, Kandalam Hotel was built in front of a rock. So behind the hotel is a rock, right? So when this was built, there were a lot of issues, a lot of objections that ruining the character and all that. But today, if you go to the other side of the lake and look at this, you don't see a hotel. You see a completely green patch. All the uh, uh, trees have fallen from the top and it's covered the entire building. You can't see a building there. Except in the night when the lights are on, you can see the light coming. So it's very creatively done, I must say. And it's the first hotel which won the Leeds Platinum Plate in the world. So that's uh, that's Kandalama. Then there are many, I like Lunukaga. Then this is one of the few or one office building that was built or designed by Jeffrey Bava, Shield Corporation office. And then, of course, you know, this is the new parliament building which was built in the lake, right? All right. This was built by the Japanese. And of course, uh, the Sri Lankan uh, engineering fraternity was very advanced at that time. And so, Jim Bajibai, and he had an engineer called Dr. Pulo Gusindaram. Ah, he's a genius. I can remember when I was doing my master's, I had to sign something which I wanted to can't leave off 30, 40 feet or something. I, so, nobody was. Willing to tell me, give me confidence to do that. I went to Dr. Pulo, nothing about no one, you do it. And I'll tell you, if they ask, ask you a question, this is the way to answer. So he was such a genius. So he's the one who was the engineer, structural engineer in charge of the new parliament building. So there's a nice story about this because Jeffrey Bauer is very famous uh, to do changes while the construction is going on. So I mean, not for, it's all for good because he, Maybe miss something and go. So when this uh, building was uh, uh, done, the the working drawings or the construction drawings are by, by uh, done by the Japanese Mitsui Construction Company. They did the and they had five thousand drawings, right? And they brought the first set of drawings and they had a meeting with Subawa in his office so that he could go through. And the second page in the journal, Subawa said, uh, "So and so." Can we do a little change here? <laughs> so the Japanese guy, had, so Mr. Bhav, I talk, telling me to change all these 5,000 drugs. Just look at it, that's all. <laughs> right. Another story about Jeffrey Bhav, I was said, you see, one of these hotels in uh, down south, when you enter, you don't see anything in the lobby. You see the pool, and then nothing else to see. It's built to that, so you don't see anything. No only the coconut trees, one or two coming up, everything, otherwise you don't see the beach, anything, the pool and seal out into the sea. So this hotel had a problem during the monsoon. Water comes because monsoon is very bad in Sri Lanka, right? Comes with the wind, the water comes through the lobby and passes to the entrance, and it's an open lobby. So the maintenance guys had a problem. So they were fighting for it, and they want to put some curtains and things like that. And with great difficulty, the owner, if you come see brought Mr. Baba to the hotel. So I can't, they are all blaming me. Can you please come and help me? So Mr. Baba came. And all the maintenance guys thought that, okay, we are going to give him a. They said, sir, this is happening. What comes to that? So he, he was ready for the answer. Then he asked one question. How many days does it happen like this? Out of 365 days of the year. So these guys said five days, maybe maximum 10 days. Only 10 days. Keep doing that and you walked out. 
<laughs> so he didn't want to destroy the design or the feeling, you see? So he's like that. Then about the minute, the first lady. Uh, she's another thing that I must tell about her is that she's the first Asian lady of the RIB membership. And she has worked with Le Corbusier before she came back to Sri Lanka. And I had the fortune of working with this lady. Then came the Belt and Road Initiative in the modern era. Comes the Nelum Kuluna, the Tower, and Nelum Pokuna. And then, of course, not during the Belt and Road Initiative, BMIC did the most popular meeting venue in Sri Lanka built by the Japanese in a funded project, right? Nelum Pokhara, of course, came recently. So these are Chinese influence in Sri Lanka. Then comes the influence again from China and India and so forth, the multi-stories, right? So, so this particular building is now fully green, right? Particular building is now fully green and it won a platinum, uh, the Green Building Council of Sri Lanka platinum rating recently. Then comes the modern era, the young architects work. You see, the young architects, of course, they have learned from the past, the courtyard and the other, but the shapes they are using is more cubism. Right, all square, rectangle stuff. Maybe the people also like them, right? Lot of, lot, not many people want to build a house with traditional railings and things like that. Today's context, they like to go for modern era, and then so some examples of that. Then this this particular building uh, thing I must mention because this one, the Sri Lanka of Architects. Uh, Excellence Award, three years back, I was also in the jury. This building is entire bamboo construction. In a very popular restaurant in Elva. So that is the, the, the modern architects or the young architects are now looking at sustainable materials being used. That's a good sign, right? So this is, you can see the both the roof, entire thing is bamboo. Here you can see even the front, all the columns, the handrails, the whole works is all bamboo. And even the floor is bamboo floor, right? So, yeah, it's, so that I want to take an example to show that how the young architects are moving forward. Here's what I talked about cubism, right? You can see the greenery is coming in, right? Courtyards are there. You can see the skylight coming in, right? Using skylight. Then the courtyards. So some pictures of modern era. Then this is the not an interesting part very much about the profession of architecture in Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan architecture got organized in 1957 with a few members of the uh, RIBA joining together and setting up the Ceylon Institute of Architects in 1957. And in 1976 was the, the Sri Lanka Institute of Architects was set up with the Act of Parliament, right? Where the entire practice of architecture is controlled by the Institute, right? And in 1997, Architect Registration Board was set up. And the unique thing about that again is the only country in the world where the Registration Board comes under the Act of the Institute of Architects. RIBA, different from the ACOC. I'm sure it's the same thing in Australia, same thing in India, uh, Pakistan, but our forefathers have been brave enough to get it under our Act. So we have total control of the registration. No government officials can control it. So that's one plus point that we have to mention that. Then, of course, these are details, all the approvals, uh, what you call the, the licensing, all are done by, it has to go through this line. 
So that's the end of the story. Of course, I need to, before I stop, I need to mention a few names about uh, yeah. See, uh, I do this whenever I do a talk elsewhere because uh, some names of my mentors, right? Professor Rupert Peary, late Professor Rupert Peary was the professor when I joined the university as an architecture student. And uh, I must say that, you see, I was the first uh, uh, president of the Architecture Students Association and the first assistant lecturer of the University of Monotoba in architecture. And the first student member of the Institute of Architects. So after that, people followed me. That's okay. Then from the Lakshman Ali, my mentor, who I worked with a lot of periods, he was a professor of architecture in Mordu and he studied practice. And he refused to give me to another lecturer and he said, no, 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 I must help him, right? Then, of course, uh, uh, Professor uh, Architect Surat is one of the senior most architects. And Dr. Roland Silva, he's the one who initiated the Cultural Triangle Project and made all the efforts and he was president of UNESCO for a while. And so those are the names I need to mention. And Dr. Seneca Bandarna, who was a historian for well, my lecturers. So these are the people who had put all these things in my mind. Thank you very much. Any questions?